Hello and welcome back to the Not So Fit Couple podcast with your hosts, Lucy Davis. And Bish Handless. And who? My name in Polish. Have you, is that something that you're going to start doing every episode? Why would my name change in any other language? It would not. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that threw me off. Is that something you had planned? No. But wow, that mean. really just, yeah. Why would your name last change? last week was in Japanese and you didn't question that as well. Yeah, sorry, your accent changed. God, no, you're Benjamin Haldon. Why would your name change? That was so weird. <laughs> I That really threw me off then. Oh, God. Well, see, that, look, that started off with a giggle, didn't it? So. We, well, it's either we start off with a joke or we start off with you doing something ridiculous like and that. What would your name be in Japanese then? Lucy Davis. Great. I'm glad we've established, we've established that. that. Yeah. Today's episode, we have such an exciting... It's kind of an <coughs> announcement in a way, I feel... Mm-hmm. Because it's something that's been in the works for well, it, a while. It's a product that I've we've both been using for about a month or so. And um this is this is for me one of the most exciting collabs that we've done and one of the most exciting podcast sponsorships. And also, if you're not watching on YouTube, I don't know where you're at, but I am actually holding it on camera and this is the ag1 from athletic greens now as ben so, said so this episode is sponsored by oh yes this episode is sponsored by athletic, athletic Green. greens as ben said i'm just going to hold it up for, you can't probably see it very well can you guys but i'm going to have mine now it's something we have daily when me and ben went to america so when did we go the 4th of may yeah may the 4th be so with you a month ago no we went on the third we got engaged on the fourth yeah because remember the fourth um but we took the travel packs with us now the travel packs are just the one serving size and i think we probably took enough for the whole 16 days we were there i think the last day we just ran out and we have seen so many benefits from these products and i i mean if you go back a few podcast episodes you remember ben talking about his really really bad stomach ibs yeah i thought i had ibs and it was it wasn't quite ibs i don't think but it was like stress related and just a lot going on with your stomach and you were very bloated, very sore. And from taking the AG1, Ben's stomach just like completely settled <coughs> in terms of like pain, how you're feeling. It's it's definitely helped since I started taking I'm it. I'm just going to add And in. we took the travel oh. packs away. I think the thing that I found most convenient about AG1 is that it, um, I call it like the foundation to your day because... Before that, I was taking a lot of multivitamins, lots of different tablets, pills, and basically I was able to get them all in, travel with them in just one little single sachet. sachet. So that's been super convenient as well as just getting them in because at the end of the day, nobody really, everyone's shit at getting the, the greens and veggies yeah, five times, it, don't it, they? they are. So this just covers you for the day, so even, even if you're terrible at getting it in. So there is mine, YouTube channel, if you can see. Um, so I'm going to be sipping on that away from microphone yeah. so you don't get any you probably see me movies. posting it quite often on instagram story but just not saying what it is because we wait until now to, to announce the uh the partnership yeah 100 percent. so we obviously do have a code for you and a link so if you click the link below and the code is not so fit you will receive one year supply of vitamin d3 k2 and then you'll get five of the travel packs of ag1 and these are all free with a purchase of your ag1 pack so this is your little bougie tub yeah. by the way for the pack but yeah that is literally incredible um sponsorship for us because it's a product that we absolutely love well obviously i've been doing fodmap as well so the really good thing is that it's gluten-free has no eggs no added sugar nut free and dairy free so um oh, super, it, super convenient it is literally so tasty big up athletic greens big up whoop whoop zips it so this week's podcast is also Lucy's going to chat to you because now her new trainer is live on the micro school. Oh my God, yeah. So this, when does this podcast go live? Is it 7, 8, 9th? 9th, 4, 10th. The hybrid half program is live. It's something that I've been working on for so long now. And it's a program that is going to build you up from doing your strength training and you run into doing a half marathon. I'm not going to chat about it too much. There's so much information on the link below. And with the code hybrid half, all in caps locks, you can get 21% off. Mm-hmm. and it's just incredible the program is freaking phenomenal obviously it's on the my coach school app but yeah definitely go and check that out yeah oh no front doorbell front doorbell's ringing do you know what's so funny with the cameras around the house when the front doorbell rings me and ben just like watch it hello <laughs> he's been 
sometimes you just have to help a neighbour out, don't you? Yeah, you do. You do? Cool. So, uh, also, I had this funny meme, funny meme popped up as well. Are you laughing already? You were Because ju- you were just in a trance then for yeah, so long. I was, I was like, Ben. Picture. It's something on Pinterest, right? Oh, I love a Pinterest page. Okay, it's just, it's funny. Go on. Is it I'll funny? Just, I'll, read it out. I'll read it out. Okay. okay. Stop, stop laughing now because you need to keep a straight face. All right. I'm a broccoli and I look like a tree. Yeah. yeah. I am a walnut and I look like a brain. A brain? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I am a mushroom and I hate this game. Oh, because it looks like a ball. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a peanut. <laughs> it but like a ball sack. Right. Have you ever ate mushrooms and thought I'm eating? Wait, sorry. A sack of how sorry? How does how does a willy look like a mushroom? Let's stop this game because I feel like I've got a. Do you know what I ever? We have jokes. This is why. <laughs> Maybe There'd like been a absolutely banana. Zero point, point in us going to a comedy club, you know. I'd sit no, there, I think I think I every no. single thing. <laughs> I think sorry I just had to like no. picture the mushroom in my head really good mean though I don't know yeah. fantastic I don't know if anyone just whilst we're on the topic of the, the jokes I was speaking to Cal about the new Ricky Gervais show on Netflix the other day there's been quite a big uproar about it I don't watch it because you said because you oh, said it was so, so funny. yeah but you also said it was so controversial and I'm a bit like the weird thing, about the thing stuff that like I that. think the comedy is is that it's not uh, it's like I, I compare it to a film. So you know when people are making films and there's films about race, there's films about uh, sex, there's films about slavery. It's it's not the film writers aren't writing it and going, this is what we think. They're, they're writing a story about controversial topics and that's what comedians are doing. They're writing a script. They're writing a, like a, a film would write a script and they're coming out and they're giving a performance like you were doing film and that's mm. how i a lot of times see comedy it's not ricky gervais going this is what i think about trans people and it's what i think about women he's creating a script to try and make people laugh do you think maybe it's because i don't find everything he says funny i maybe, feel like offended but no, but that's what i feel sometimes when i watch comedy watch comedy what do you think carl because you're into your comedy as well yeah i think when things are not particularly uh i don't know if it's like a lack of pc but when when things make you go oh god that's a bit naughty. That's what comedians are there to say. But I find that stuff funny as well. Yeah, yeah. That's like when, uh, what's his name? Uh, God, the guy who does Mock the Week. Oh, uh, no. Jimmy Carr. Yeah. Like, he'll stand up on screen and start talking about people's dead nans and stuff. And that just makes me absolutely die. Yeah. It's so funny. But if someone said that to me in, in the street, I would like, oh, cool. Yeah. Let's fight. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, maybe I just get, I think, too far into the joke. I think some people just see it as a, a personal attack on them or other people yeah no i think he's hilarious like, he is hilarious but then there's this, the odd thing that i've listened to when we watch his youtube shows and talks i've been like ben ben did you hear what you ben ben what yeah. the fuck did you just say so that's probably i find him hilarious yeah. but it is one of those things today's podcast we have a fantastic array of topics but they're all under the same umbrella i would yeah, say no, we're so we're talking about, about nutrition and dieting and um some of the pros and cons of different types of diets and some phrases i think the big one that's the thing that i've noticed come up a lot recently again it's been rearing its head is the term cheat days oh are we starting on cheat days why not let's fucking dive in oh i was gonna go with yo-yos i can we can absolutely start on cheat can days you p- can you pivot i've pivoted Good. can i give you the definition of cheat yeah because i thought this is quite interesting in terms of where the where the connotation of the name has even come from well, no. in terms of like cheat days so the definition of cheat, an act of dishonesty or unfairly in order to gain an mm-hmm. advantage. And I think putting the word cheat day, that doesn't give you unfairly in order to give an advantage. It doesn't give you an advantage. I think it's a really weird mixture of words put together. But, but is it because people are talking about cheating on your partner? Like why would that give an you an advantage? An act of dishonesty. Ah, okay. So it could be an act. People think they're being dishonest to their current yeah, yeah, diet. Exactly. You're they're cheating, cheating on, your diet. on your current diet, which has, yeah. I think, psychologically, has really, really poor connotations. Yeah. Very bad connotations. Having the word cheat day. I don't. I don't agree with it being used. It can be a very negative, and you just poor. It can create poor associations with food. Um. But then there's some people who don't get affected by it, or the, or the method of doing it. In what sense? Some people will say, oh, I'll do a cheat day. 
and what they actually mean is that they'll go on a Saturday night and they'll just go for a meal, but they just call it a cheat day because it's kind of become a social norm to to say it. Whereas some people will use the term cheat day and they will use the full thing as a binge. And just like we, remember when we used to do the cheat days, we used to do it. Jesus fuck, everyone's yeah, uh, everyone's about like four it. years. Yeah, and what would happen is we'd be strict on a diet. We get to a cheat day, all day would be carnage. We'd 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 go out buy stuff. We'd we'd. Do you remember the cake? The cake is what I'm getting what the to. Fuck, we did. Why did we do that? That was, probably that was weighed. insane. I reckon that weighed like a five kilo plate. Shall I explain what the cake is? Yeah. That's so funny. Also, how we knew exactly what day, <sighs> and we did the carvery. We used to do a carvery point. first, and then after. It's like I called the fuck me cake because it like after so, it. <sighs> me, and, well, to be fair, we hadn't been together that long. Probably like five or six months, and we went to buy this massive chocolate cake, and then we're thinking that's not enough. We bought bags and bags of sweets like magic stars, M and M's, and then something else. And then we bought a pot of salted caramel buttercream. We got home and we like redecorated this cake. Bear in mind it was already decorated. And we just sat there with forks and ate this thing until we were physically basically sick. And we were like, Oh, we've we've accomplished our cheat day. What a what a weird mindset that was. The problem is it when you're strict that cake. you then over over consume. And what you were saying there about we didn't think it was enough. I don't think we, we didn't think it was enough. I think what happens is that we go, right, okay, I'm not getting this amount of food or this type of food again now until next Saturday. So let's try and fit as much as we can in possible in this time frame because mm-hmm. I know I'm not going to get it again for another week. And this is why I'm a fan a lot of the time of people having cake, biscuits, chocolate, whatever it is through the week in moderation and using the tactic of reduction rather than removal because then you don't restrict and then over consume. I think and, so. and then a lot of people, what they do is, and we do the same thing, is essentially use the term, the term cheat day instead of the word binge eating because at the end of the day, you're just mass binging and you're just using a different term to create a social norm from binge eating, which is a, which is a big problem a lot of the time. I also think as well, sorry, I just finished off my greens there, look at that. I feel like I don't mix it very well. I'm not very good at doing that. Yeah. The um, the one thing that I always pick up pick up on is I don't think the word cheat has ever been in a sentence that is is necessarily good. Cheat girls, bro. There you go, straight away, boom. Yeah, but even cheat girls just cheat in the reps. But it's acceptable. I just don't think the word cheat ever comes into into like good context. We give you one. Like cheating. Oh, behave yourself. Cheating on someone, cheating on your diet, it it automatically thinks or cheat places... codes. PlayStation used to use them all the time. Okay, stop thinking about them now. But you get my <laughs> you get my main point. I don't even know what that is. So it doesn't count. It it automatically thinks. So when we used to do it, we always used to think, okay, so we're cheating on our diet. So it has to be really, really bad, like naughty food. And obviously, the past couple of years, we've re- we've really come a long way with our diets both coming out of eating disorders i don't associate or see good and bad food food is food and there is certain foods that you'll have in moderation more so than the nutritionally dense foods but with these like cheat days you you automatically think it has to be shit tons of chocolate oily saturated cheesy but like it has to be that food yeah so you 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 do eat it and you get so full you 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 get full to feeling sick well, that's what we used to do. The, the big question is then, how does that make you feel the next day? Well, that's what that's where it does. As you said, it starts because, to happen where you think you've... Because then what creeps binged. in is, is on a Sunday, you're getting up with feelings of guilt. You're feeling right now I need to restrict again. You think I've got to move more. I've got to go and run more. I've got to go and exercise more. I can't eat the food, foods that I want to have. I potentially can't be as social. And that's where it's better to sort of span your weekend out and not cram everything in because you can be more social over a weekend rather than being so restrictive because you just blasted everything on a, a Saturday night. I'm not saying don't go out on a Saturday every now and again and fill your, fill your booths or go out on the booze. I'm not saying that, but you also want to try and get that more of an 80-20 split overall within your nutrition and your diet so you can create some flexibility and some balance of it within that as well because I pretty much now eat chocolate every single day because then I get to a Saturday I don't feel like I need to eat that much of it mm. or don't eat that. I don't really go on a Saturday. I'm going to plan this to have or whatever because I just have stuff through the week when I want it and I don't crave it when I get to a Saturday. I don't need to over consume it because I've already had a fair amount that fits inside my needs during the week. The big thing that came to mind when I thought this as well 
is that the effects of labor and stuff, cheap meals or having the poor associations with food can last a very, very long time. And the thought about the WhatsApp that you sent to me whilst you were in London with Fliss just this weekend gone. Oh, yeah. I didn't say it was a cheat, though. No, but the reason oh, why sorry, you created reason... poor associations with pizza is potentially because of poor relationships with food that you've had in the past, which is around this topic. Well, yeah. So I went to London to see Fliss and we went to Pizza Express and I was going to get pasta. Basically, pizza was the first food, essentially, that in my head made me bulimic. It was the first food that I purged. And since then, so we're going back, what, six years? Six, six, six and a half, seven years. I have not had pizza in that length of time. And Fliss was like, get the pizza and I was like but I could get the pasta because I have still seven years six years on such a bad memory still very tarnished and and almost as if oh my god Lucy you're gonna go it's gonna happen had this pizza goat cheese and red onion bit of fucking pickle on it I don't know what it was it was so tasty and I sent you a picture and I was like I've just had a pizza yeah. and you were like instantly <clears throat> how did you feel that's all Ben said was how did you feel because he knows I've not had it in six years and there was and what i know that doesn't sound like a big hurdle for someone to come over but for me it it is always been there in my head hasn't it that i've just had a really poor association yeah well that's what association or correlation is different to causation i'm i'm the same with pizza and the reason why i don't have a lot of pizza now i think is because when i did that ten thousand calorie challenge and i was sick as a dog the thing that made me, the, the, the last thing I had before being sick was pizza. So I. Like Domino's. Yeah, I I've got Domino's. bad. I used to battle with Domino's in every weekend. Like a large. Yeah. And um, those hot cookie things as well. They are wow. elite. Yeah. <laughs> they are really. They are fucking something really else. They're really tasty. So, yeah, it can be. It can be difficult. And again, there is certain people, especially like inside the bodybuilding community, that will still push this terminology. There's even personal trainers that I think create this stigma or still use this term cheat meal within inside people's nutrition and diet plans that they set for people even if they don't call it a cheat meal it's the psychology of what a cheat meal stands for i think that's still created which is which is why as well we don't within inside the micro school we don't set people nutrition programs anymore yeah. because i think by giving people a, a calorie set and a protein target it leaves a lot more flexibility within inside their day-to-day their week-to-week to be able to be more restrictive with certain foods mm-hmm. that are too calorically dense instead of removing them altogether. Same with one-to-one clients. Like we were speaking to Amelia, Dr. Amelia, the other week was about having Saturday to potentially call it or label it a day to eat a bit more intuitively. That Now, that's not an in, invite to a binge party. It's a day to just be more mindfully eating about what you're doing and eat when you feel hungry, eat to satiety maybe, and go out and have fun with friends and family. He is back from collecting his phone on the bin. Yeah. I do you know I did that the other day though, didn't I? I put my phone on the bin. Forgot. Within two seconds, I was like a goldfish. Open the bin and my phone flew off and the screen cracked. And I was like, Ben, I've just cracked my phone screen. It was luckily the thing on top though, because I am that good. Sorry, I just thought I'd add that in with my that, bin issue. I mean, even when you have to order a new foot screen protector, it's annoying because I have spares. I basically got a screen protector on my car. A very expensive <laughs> screen protector and a skimmed the gate the other day skimmed it and basically had to get it redone yeah you don't you don't want to go near ben when something's happened to his car you just slowly slide away from him and just say you okay and then just leave him to it one of the the points that i was going to make just before you move on was the whole thing that we say to people is reduction not complete restrictions of foods that you enjoy and want in your diet Mm -hmm. so as you said your I mean, I probably have a Mars bar of some sort, like a Mars bar, a, what's that other one? A boost or something like that a day, just because I do. And that isn't something that I ever thought I'd used to be able to do. I thought if I had one, I'd have to have the pack or I would binge on so many. And I bet there's a few listeners thinking, well, Lucy, I can't just have one piece of chocolate. Well, you probably can. You genuinely, it might take a bit of work, but... You probably can have a piece of chocolate and not eat the whole bar. That, that comes down to as well, though, is like I've been saying about a Saturday. I no longer feel like I need to get to a Saturday now and I've bought uh, 
a, a fucking shit ton of chocolate yeah. in order to, to satisfy cravings because I'm satisfied by one or two pieces because it's not been removed from a diet completely. I actually think as well, it will give you an overall more healthy relationship mm. with food. And this isn't at all saying, you know, have a bar of chocolate for breakfast and stupid shit like that. I mean, you're not going to feel great off that, are yeah. you? But it's having the ability to have it within your diet and create that stronger relationship with food. So as Ben said then, when you do get to a Saturday, you're not burning and waiting for that meal on a Saturday evening. Like you, you're just not. You're going you're gonna to really, really enjoy the week so much more with that bit more relaxivity. Mm -hmm. Do you guys mind if I just quickly bring up something? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Now, Weight Watchers have this system. Now, we're talking about like labeling things as cheat and like inherently oh, bad. Weight shit. Watchers says that every day you're allowed a certain amount of sins. Bad, bad. And that comes with like meals that have certain amounts of butter, sugar, fat, and every oh. day you're sinning. What are your thoughts on that? Because that seems to me like a clear cut way to make people have a really shit relationship with things that are healthy. Just have a little bit more sugar, a bit more fat, a bit more butter, and you're sinning. Sin, sin, sin. Bad, bad, bad. Negative. Yeah, there's um. There's been a lot of conflict with Weight Watchers, but I don't agree really agree with the whole sin thing because I think that potentially creates poor relationships with association again. But then my question is that I'm internally playing with is if a lot of people are viewing certain foods as inherently bad anyway from social norms, if they're labeling them sins, but they're allowed to have those sins every single day, is that a good thing? I don't believe so because I think they'd sin food such as pasta and bread. Which and they're people, not Which people, foods. by the way, who are in your everyday and that's who their consumer is or that's who their customer is, potentially thinks, oh, I can't have bread because it's bad for me. I can't have pasta because it's bad for me. But they're saying you can have that all the time. It, do you, but my point there was I assume on Weight Watchers those sort of foods are labelled as sins. Yeah, they are labelled as sins. So that's a really big negative for me because they're... What, what I'm saying is, if, this is, this is by the way, me sitting on the fence asking questions, is if those people are already seeing bread and pasta bad anyway and not including it in a diet for that reason, if Weight Watchers are going, do you know what, you can, you can have this much of that in your diet each day. Yeah, I appreciate that, but I also think it enhances the stereotype But these of those people, foods. what I'm saying is, these people are already seeing bread and pasta as bad. But do you not think they need to unlearn that from people like us? Yeah, but what I'm saying is, I'm just trying to get get either side of the argument. I think there's mm. some good that can come from it. I'm, I'm saying, potentially the association with calling it a sin may not be great, but if they're kind of converting people over to bringing it into their diet every day. There's some things from Weight Watchers, by the way, and I, I see loads of personal trainers calling out all the time, and sometimes rightly so, I also think there's quite a lot of good things that can come out of Weight Watchers for some people. There's some good, there's some bullshit in there, some good strategies, but there's a reason why it's a multi-billion pound company because they do do some good stuff. Yeah, I'm literally not saying anything against that. I just think using the word sin is a categoric big fat no. Do you know why I often think sometimes Weight Watchers gets a bad vibe as well? It's because it's called out by bodybuilders or yeah. people who are fitness extremists who don't need to know that kind of stuff or we got it what i always try and think now is i put my general karen 30 year old 40 year old woman mum lives down the road works nine to five head on when i'm trying to think about these kind of things because they're the type of people that most of these brands are trying to market to and the people that are trying to help they're not trying to help people like me and you who are, who are you know they're trying to help you everyday person isn't weight watchers though one of the brands or companies that people go back to most because it fails the most amount of times i have no idea that's that is true or not do you know if that's that's true cal it's some i don't know i might have just only seen that on social media so i don't know the validity the thing is though what we know is that we are terrible at maintaining weight loss in any form yeah yeah 100 percent. okay so apparently weight watchers have an 11 percent success rate so 89 percent of people who try weight watchers fail i don't know what that's like compared to dieting that's probably better than do you think yeah i mean if you look at the stack card, i can't remember off the top of my head of the failure of diets i mean this is where it's a bit of bullshit because how do we really know how many people failed on a diet has yeah. someone gone around with a fucking clipboard asking every single person that's ever done a diet it's it have the validity of the studies or something that it's a question i think as well a lot of people say that for like new years oh i'm gonna not eat they go crazy strict oh i'm yeah. not eating anything bad and then next friday comes and they go, oh, i'll have a tidbit yeah um 
yeah, I think Weight Watchers is also one of the companies that does public weigh-ins. So there's like a lot of yeah, I don't like that. Come with don't that. Like that. What are your thoughts on that? That's like with Been your there, swimming. Done that. Yeah, awful. I that I think from my swimming days, I was weighed before and after every single session. Th- fucks me up. That is not normal for a 14, 15, 6 year old girl to be weighed constantly because then all you judge yourself and you identify as how much you weigh. I identified, oh, I need to be below 50 kilograms. It, it's almost got an element to me of a fat shame as well because if someone hasn't lost weight, then it's like everyone sees it. And the other thing that doesn't take into consideration is if the weigh-ins are once per week, that might be that day's pers- that that day for that person where they always weigh higher. I have a lot of clients that weigh themselves daily, which is often the better way to do it, that will see the fluctuations and will take the low points for the week. Also, that person who's turned up to Weight Watchers at whatever time, 6 p.m. at night, because that didn't have a big lunch, they might not have been for a shit that day. They might be on the week of menstruation. Uh, there could be a l- lot of different things that will not be seen or picked up by the scales and weighing in once per week. Do you know why we were way before and after each session? To see if we were hydrated or not. So if we weighed less after, apparently we were dehydrated, which is bizarre to me because we weren't allowed to go out the pool to go for a wee. Yeah. So we're weeing in the pool, drinking three, four liters of water a session. They were basing it, weighing us so much to see if we'd lost water weight. And I'm like, you are all crazy. I look back now, I'm like, you're actually crazy. Like what a weird thing that you did and we were all so obsessed sorry off topic i saw some doctor again post something on online this weekend and it was about weeing in pools and about weeing in showers now it's bad for you we weren't allowed to get out of the pool so i had I just no, i'm just saying yeah it what was, was some, his... something to do with again more so association so what if you always pay every time that you're in, you're in the shower because you hear running water every time you hear running water <laughs> you're gonna want to pay <laughs> Who? D- I'm sorry. Comment on YouTube if you don't wee in the shower. I'm just saying. I'm just no, I'm saying do, I just be so cute. Do you wee in the shower? I do weird shit in the shower. I mean, I don't you do wee in the shower though, Cal. Do you wee in the shower? Of course, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Comment on YouTube if you wee in the shower because I mean that's really interesting. One hundred percent. If I hear running water, I'm like mm. I have to go to the toilet. That's really interesting. Like if you if you piss me off, I'll sometimes piss in your shampoo pot. No. <laughs> I don't. I'm joking. That's a joke, by the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was a joke. I shit in it instead. Um, Sorry, I had one last point on Weight Watchers. Yeah. The one benefit that I do believe it has is the community element. Yeah. Big community. You're all doing it together. Similarly. Similarly. It's a new word. But better is obviously the My Coach School. Yeah. Same community. That's what it is. I believe that Weight Watchers do have that, which is, yeah, why, which is why a lot of people will go People back. will succeed. Mm-hmm. Mic drop. Um, back onto the, the cheat days debate. The thing with that will also happen is you will also weigh a fuckload more the next day because there's a lot more glycogen, so there's going to be more water, and also there's going to be a lot more um, food in the digestive system and the GI tract. So something to bear in mind of when you're going to weigh yourself the next day after doing a cheat day kind of things, you are going to weigh a lot more, which sometimes messes with people's logic of a thought. And also, I think a lot of people think, right, if I'm dieting, this is going to be my point of the week, which sort of nips things in the bud where I've got craving. This is what's going to stop that. But what they, what people have actually found is it actually enhances that craving. Yeah. Like, do you ever think, oh, I wasn't hungry until I had something to eat? sometimes your hunger spikes after having yeah. food so that's that's it it's exactly the same sorry i was just pulling up um i was just making sure my stat was right in terms of how much water does one gram of glycogen hold it's two to three grams of water so when you have eaten like a <clears throat> cheat meal or something a lot of food you're going to be also holding on to so much water weight like triple the amount you usually would so a lot of the time it's water retention as yeah. well which people don't think they just think oh my god i've just put on five pounds of fat no you've not it it is water i think that's just a valid I think the point. number is for every gram of glycogen inside the cell it's two to three grams of water. two to three grams of water yeah which is quite a lot it is two mm-hmm. to three grams of water retained it is is substantial the other reason some people do it is because again they see bodybuilders doing oh i'm a cheat meal this week because i need it to fuel glycogen or whatever shit bullshit it is or i need to be fuller sometimes it's not bullshit but um if you are 
30 year old Karen is living down the road who started dieting a couple of weeks ago. You do not need a cheat meal, a diet break, whatever, because you need to look fuller <laughs> when you go about the gym. Like you don't need that. The the thing that you may need every now and again, maybe a short diet break. You may need for one week up your calories a little bit because you're super fatigued or motivation's really low or something happened in your life or uh, hormones are changed or it's that time during menstruation. Whatever the reasons may be, there may be a point where you need to go, okay, I'm going to up my calories back to maintenance. This point, so if I'm dieting on 1,700 calories, my maintenance is 2,100. What I'll do for this week is whilst I'm feeling shit is I'll up it to 2,100. And for that extra 400 calories, I'll have some foods that are already in my diet so my volume's a lot bigger so I'm more satiated more full which means we've got better energy for the week training's better I feel fuller and I'm ready to go in a diet again the week after one of the things that is crazy to me and I actually don't follow many bodybuilders at all it's not something I wish to see it just doesn't trust me the companies who are specifically called like cheat day post bodybuild the massive like boxes and bikini crates, bakers bikini, bikini bakers or whatever they're called that to me i'm sorry if you have a business and you're listening that is a poor poor concept because that could enhance a fight even more of course it does like that is in my mind i'm like whoa you literally i just can't wrap my head around that it became again a cultural norm of inside it is, it is bodybuilding a com- norm. competitions because i had a basket in the back of my car once i finished my first bodybuilding show that was just absolutely full full of white chocolate everything you can think of nothing i would even ever be able to consume in a week was just in there so why because it was just like everyone did it it was like oh restrict the 16 weeks and then you can have all this shit afterwards so So it's just just a massive binge being a sheep following the crowd doing what everyone else does is it was it that kind of like cultural if you didn't do it you were weird not really no i also craved like fucking yeah Loads of other people are doing it. Yeah. It's just a really interesting concept to me. I think it's just crazy. Uh, I don't know if it is crazy. Really? Yeah. Maybe that's because I've come from a place No, but what of... I'm saying is if you're going to restrict yourself from eating any kind of food, you're going to crave like fuck. That's just, phys- it's just part of Yeah, but physio- I don't physiology. think you need 10 boxes of like sh- brownies and cookies why and... why would someone need to go into a cupboard and fill a face and to look uncomfortably full and feel upset with themselves what do you mean why would someone go into a cupboard who's a binge eater and absolutely smash the back off of the cupboard eating every single thing that's in there and eating more than they'd ever consumed before oh i don't get the question <laughs> why do you not i'll repeat it again why would a binge eater need to go into a cupboard and eat all the food in there to look uncomfortably full and feel bad about themselves they don't need to. I know, but it's because of ref- restricted food. Exactly how a bodybuilder is just done for 16 weeks. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's just, it's just something that I just don't really agree with. I'm not saying but, I agree with it. Um, and you yeah. can't say, oh, I wouldn't agree with a binge eater because they're not, they can't help it. Yeah. Hmm. It's very interesting. I, just, I think that's as well, though. I come from a place where I'm not massive on bodybuilding for females because of the effect it has on your body. Yeah, what I'm trying so to I think what I'm, I'm trying to get at by like explaining that. this is that there is going to be the element of I've restricted food intake for a long, long time. Yeah. So as soon as I eat something that's satiating, I'm going to want it in abundance and can't stop. Yeah. It's just a poor relationship with food, it is. I believe. So I just wanted to give that as an example, just for everyone who's listening. Mm-hmm. And it? also actually kind of brings us on to the one of the topics that we were going to speak about as well. Your dieting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Really, like, significantly. I'd be interested to hear your take on this and I'll give you mine. Well, yo-yo dieting, what I believe is cycling your weight, your body weight, jumping from diet to diet, putting on weight, going on a diet. It's mm. not working. You go back, you try a different diet. And the yo-yo term... This is actually what I read online because I wasn't 100% sure. But the yo-yo term and yo-yo dieting leads to long-term struggles with weight and a greater risk of obesity because you're going from diet to diet. And I think there would be so many different reasons why people aren't sticking to diets, whether it's Mm -hmm. accountability, whether it's they've been on too low calories, whether the diet just generally isn't enjoyable and it's not for them and they're forcing themselves to do it. 
and then they stop and then they go back on the bandwagon. Yeah. So that's what I believe yo-yo dieting is. Yeah. It's, uh, the only thing I was going to say is it's not the same as people doing what we would typically call bulking and cutting cycles. That's not the same as yo-yo dieting. Yeah. And I don't even like those terms either. I prefer like a lean gaining period because no one's wanting to put on body fat and get bulky. Uh, but that's not the same thing, just to be clear. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, 100%. So when people go on like a strict cut, they're doing... And also, I think people who do bulk and cut, they're very like head-driven. They know exactly what calories they yeah. need to be on. They know exactly what they need to be doing. Yo-yo dieting, I think, is more so people who who want the help but aren't 100% sure. So they try loads of different diets. Yeah. What also tends to happen with people who yo-yo diet is they are very responsive to short-term fluctuations. And what I mean by that is what usually happens is people will do a bit of a cut and then maybe they'll take a couple of days off, they'll go on a piss, they'll go on a holiday, whatever. See, that weight has come back up. And then whatever the fat mass may be, die then like, oh shit, I need to die quickly again and just be really, really super aggressive. And what tends to happen is they, um, the fat mass c- comes up a little bit. Yeah. And the metabolic rate is still quite low from them dieting. So it never like truly recovers and they go back into cutting cycles again. This is quite often why when people diet and then put on weight and then they'll diet and then put on weight and then diet like yo-yo dieting is that the metabolic rate never truly catches up Mm. 100%. But then they go back into a dieting phase again and wonder like, oh, why have I got a diet on less calories this time than I did last time? There is going to be changes in, in metabolic rate slightly, which won't recover. So essentially what you've got is this yo-yo effect of weight, but now your fat mass is high and metabolic rate is low and you're not recovering from dieting, but then you're going to find it harder to lose weight potentially next time versus if you diet and then go into a gaining phase or a maintenance phase instead of just splurging out, it's going to help you kind of recover yourself and your body a lot more efficiently. With the yo-yo dieters then, from you saying they would try something for a few days and then go out and smash a weekend and then they diet again is it more short-term diets that they try for like a week and they give up and then do something else i'm not even just talking about like different diet types i think that's what obviously you're talking to which is another i think form of like just i mean they like get like bouncing from one thing to another yeah like bouncing from like keto to cutting or cutting carbs is the same thing what i was talking about is is like the, the same you dying within, within inside the diet so it's going up and down up and down up and down yeah okay so it's more of like a short term period thing because actually essentially if you were doing if you were going from different diets or different calories from time to time and you're doing it for like two or three months that's not really a yo-yo is it because mm-hmm. you've stuck to it for three months yeah which is quite a considerable amount of time and then you would probably at eight or twelve weeks chill bit anyway yeah, yeah well when you've when you're done dieting so you're finished and you want to bring calories back up but bring them just back up to maintenance straight away is great because then we're going to be able to peak with calories so where they're at so you're probably going to feel better lean lean body mass is recovered so you might put some more lean tissue back on and metabolic rate is now in a better place as well rather than you going up and down like a yo-yo so hopefully we won't need to bring calories as low next time you diet because you've recovered yourself quite well quite well and this is like a bridging stage not just a jump, i.e. yo-yoing, um, which some people do quite frequently to go up and down, up and down, up and down with calories all the time. That's one of the things that I really picked up from when we spoke to Amelia was so many people think they need to reverse diet really, really slowly. Yeah. And that's even something that over the past year, my mind's changed on quite significantly. If you've been in a deficit for a long time, and you think you need to reverse diet because I think reverse diet is quite a popular word in the fitness space and people think they have to reverse diet mm-hmm. to get back up to where they were. I had a client who came to me on 1,300 calories and her personal trainer had been reverse dieting her for two months to get to 1,300 and I was That's like... so slow by the way I was, like, well. that, I was like, I'm really sorry, I'm you're going right on maintenance. Bear in mind her, her goal was to build muscle. I was like, your whoa, your calories are really, really low. You've been reversing from 1,100 to 1,300. Please tell your personal trainer that is not what you need mm-hmm. to be doing at all. 
and she's on maintenance now so she's on about 2000 she feels incredible there was there was a bit of a spike obviously in her weight for the first two weeks as there would be when you're increasing by that many calories but now it's completely leveled out i say one thing about that as well is when reverse dieting is that <sighs> most people won't go back up to maintenance because they're psychologically scared of it so people may increase by like 100 or 200 so she's been at 1300 and was moved to 1500 you are still inside a deficit yeah you are still inside of a weight loss phase so even though you're not trying to lose weight you're still in a deficit you're still gonna lose weight so that's why we will say you better just go into around maintenance or just below maintenance yeah the only real thing or play for me is where when reverse diet and maybe a consideration is when people got psychological issues with bringing calories straight back up 100%. and they're really suffering to, to to mentally digest having an uptake in food so just remember that and even when you do like you were saying then bring it back up to maintenance there's going to be a weight spike and it's not body fat mass that's come up it's just that now there's more glycogen and tissues more water there's going to be a slight spike which may come back down as you've returned to maintenance calories so just to be aware of and i think the other thing with inside that is when you decide to move back to maintenance calories some people and the feedback that i've had from members or clients is that i'm just not hungry enough to be able to get those calories back up to that place well no you're not going to be hungry enough or have the appetite to eat that much food if you're now going to put your maintenance calories and have maintenance calories consuming your diet foods and what i mean by that is yeah. a lot of people will just increase the volume of foods that they've been dieting on which if you have an extra 400 calories to play with and you're going to make that up of egg whites and broccoli and salads that's going to be a lot more food to eat as opposed to adding in i don't know a mars bar a magnum uh, a bit of avocado well, some of which is more calorically dense nut butters that's the type of thing you need to be doing and i think it's healthy in terms of your with your relationship relationships to food to mix up the food groups and sources when you do bring the maintenance calories back up and it's potentially going to give you a lot more food freedom as well yeah definitely with that girl as well just to make a point we'd obviously spoken about why she was on those calories but the thing that made me want to increase and we obviously did speak about it was she said i'm so miserable and tired so for me instantly as a coach i'm like well i know why you're feeling so tired mm -hmm. you're you're in really really you're in a massive deficit still so like you said if she was like, i'm really scared to increase my calories i probably would have put her on one five yeah. now but she's not she's gone right up because she was like i can't do this like i'm so tired at work i have no energy to train i'm like don't worry we'll sort it mm -hmm. so yeah it is very very personal and if there are personal trainers listening, definitely ask your client how they're feeling about food and why they feel that way about the calories and give your suggestion and then hear what they have to say because it is always different for every single person depending on their relationship with food. But this this girl does have a solid relationship with food. Yeah, this is why I think we're, we have terrible success rates that people maintain a weight loss once a diet and phase has been finished and why people go into yo-yos is because people feel like shit from putting weight back on and then go way too aggressive because they think I want to get back to that way that i used to be at mm -hmm. um and i think the way that we combat that is being more controlled post diet or have more of a structure post diet and education educating people better during the dieting phase so that when we come out of it we don't have poor relationships with food as well yeah 100 percent. off the back of that one of the things that i've had a lot of questions about is you've what, had so many questions about what this. we spoke about on the podcast with amelia was aggressive dieting and this is this is one of those topics that a lot of people get a sore arse about and don't quite fully understand is because i'm not telling people to go and do aggressive dieting it may, may not be always for the general population straight away who's needed um so I'll, I'll kind of explain aggressive dieting what i did before we went to america and what this did for me and also the advantages and disadvantages of doing that sort of diet can I just make one point mm -hmm. with aggressive diets? With aggressive diets, the deficits are mostly, and the majority of people, way too large for the average population. Yeah. And that's what people get wrong. They think when someone's doing an aggressive diet, they want everyone to do this, and it's not. It's super, super individual and specific to the person, and usually there's a reason as to why they're going that aggressive. But the, the, I think the thing is, is that people want results really quickly. Or people want to do something really quickly. For example, even financially. So we were looking at wedding venues last week. 
uh, we need to save up money for it. I could go, oh, do you know what? I'm going to save loads of money really quickly, which means I've got to make a lot of sacrifices and it could make it unsustainable for me to try and put that much money away that quickly. Same with dieting. That's why it's not going to be for everyone. So quick disclaimer, like you are maybe going to be more tired from aggressive dieting. Your strength will decrease. Performance may decrease. You're going to feel more hungry. That's why a lot of people think I've got a, a bit of RC about when we've had the calorie calculator on the micro school, which again, you can use any time, by the way, if you need to work out your calories. Why have, why you recommend this low calories? Well, first of all, it is the formula, which is based off, I've for, completely forgotten the guy's name now. It's the Benedict. Benedict, Benedict formula. So Harris Benedict. Har- Harris Benedict formula. Thank you, Cal. And um, the lower calorie point isn't for sticking too long term. So the, the thing to get across straight away is aggressive dieting is for a short period of time. So what I did was I did a two week dieting phase where I did 14 days low calorie intake for me, which is around 1,800 calories. Um, and I'd fast first thing in the morning. Fast, so fasting was really good for me because it left a shorter window for me to have an eating window where I could consume more food and plus don't really get hungry in the mornings. Um, anyway, so the thing to remember is that with aggressive dieting, there's going to be pros and cons. You're going to have to be mindful about your life and your lifestyle, That's, which is why I'm not saying it's for everyone. You're going to have to be mindful of some of these pros and cons that we're going to go through. You're going to have to remember that this isn't a long-term thing that you can stick to. It is like a 14-day thing. And just bear in mind, there is going to be... You're going to feel hungry. You're fucking going to feel ravenous. There's going to be times where you feel tired. Mm-hmm. Um, So just some things to remember. Uh, again, I can't say this is who aggressive dieting is for. What I would say to people is don't write aggressive dieting off. Because, again, sitting on the fence different people are very different and the way that people respond to different types of diets and the way that people preference is very 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 different um so just bear that in mind some of the pros and cons of aggressive dieting oh did you want me to list some if you've got some or what you think some of the pros and cons are well obviously the pros it decreases the duration you're actually dieting for exactly so if you can just for example you could you could diet for six months or you could choose a diet for six weeks and, and still lose uh, the same amount of, of weight in that time. Exactly like saving, like we've been talking about, you're going to have to make sacrifices. So if you've got a mortgage to save for, in during that time period, you're not saving for a mortgage for your whole life, but the short time period where potentially you've got to aggressively save. But in order to do that, you've got to make sacrifices to your life. Same if you choose to do a short-term diet over a long-term diet, you have to make more sacrifices short-term. And that's one of the benefits for me with pros of aggressive dieting is that I only have to make sacrifices for short term rather than make yeah. sacrifices long term, even though they're not as aggressive sacrifices. Well, you're basically there. You're spending less time. So say over a year, you have to do fewer of these aggressive cuts. Mm-hmm. So you're spending less time spent in a suboptimal state for performance and recovery because categorically an aggressive diet, your performance is going to probably go a bit to shit. You won't have as much energy. You feel a bit lagging. But over the year, you're going to have more time in a maintenance building mm-hmm. phase where you're going to feel better. That's one of the things to I think is a massive pro to aggressive dieting because then you're not cutting for 12, 14 weeks. You're doing it for like two. Mm-hmm. So for 10 other weeks, you're at a, a more optimal place for performance. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've never come from an experience of doing an aggressive diet. It's not something that I would ever personally do. I don't really need to as an individual where you've seen really to be honest good good results from it's it it's because one i'm quite impatient but two i also <laughs> hate, I, hate, I hate i hate dieting as well so yeah. i can do something aggressive for two weeks and get it done then i'm in shape and remember like you don't have to diet forever to be in shape what you don't because you're on i was on 1800 calories it doesn't mean that i've got to stick to that calorie intake in order to maintain my weight because i did that and then when i got back off holiday I kind of a bit blase with calorie counting and stuff and just eat what I wanted again. And I've pretty much maintained weight. And that's because you can move back up to maintenance calorie to maintain that current weight that you're at. Yeah, I think one of the... Can I just think a few of the negatives? Uh, Yeah, can I just finish the pros quickly? Of course you can. So quick weight loss, quick results, which means motivation is going to be higher for a lot of people who get really bored quickly. Um, It also meant that if I, for example those bloody coro stuff that we eat all the time if i some days went slightly over my calories i know that i'm still well over inside a deficit mm. even i've taken those up whereas for some people who are in slight deficits who have that tendency to pick at stuff 
you could go 200 calories over that day you're now at maintenance you're now losing fuck all weight so that's one of the other things which again aggressive dieting can sometimes help with yes 100 percent i guess a few of the negatives are naturally you're eating less food you're being more restrictive Mm -hmm. your athletic performance would probably decrease which isn't a massive deal for everyone but personally for me that would be a big con and then it may predispose some people to overshoot their food intake will lead to binges post restriction again super individual but it could happen i say by the way categorically if you have disordered eating with food or uh, have an issue with binge eating or relationships with food aggressive dieting is not for you yeah we also actually just on that calorie calculator point for uh, on the school (laughs) when it gives you your calories on the my coach school the bottom calories is the aggressive yeah. di- dieting one. Really and we have thing. a question mark that pops up and says, please do not choose this calorie intake unless you are actually doing a controlled aggressive diet. Mm-hmm. We have put that in there because it has been questioned. And yeah, it might not be for you, but it might be for someone else. But as a disclaimer, we do have that in there saying, look, it's not for the general population. The reason why sometimes an aggressive diet is good, by the way, just before you go on a holiday is because you're then just, you've got like some food freedom because what you do it's similar to when people do um diet break so the methodology of a diet break sort of set up for uh, a dieting period would be you do two weeks aggressive two weeks of maintenance two weeks aggressive two weeks of maintenance it means your calorie intake of like a 12 week diet would probably be similar if you just stuck to a deficit for 12 weeks as normal and didn't change anything yeah so essentially you're eating the same amount of calories over that space of time it just means that every two weeks you get to do two weeks of maintenance which means your performance might be better that's all it is. And again, that some people might suit that. Some people might not. They might not deal psychologically well with bringing in calories um, up and down. Another disadvantage is that neat level is going to be affected. The reason why is that when we start yeah. pushing the scale towards the low end of food intake is that the natural things that you would do on a day-to-day basis, like me sitting here fidgeting, moving, twitching, um walking from places i'm going to become more lethargic so those natural activities that we do as human beings subconsciously will start to drop and therefore i'll expend less energy so it's exactly the same if you've got a house and you're trying to if you put less money into the heating of your house you're going to get less heat out of it mm-hmm. if you put less food and you're potentially going to get less movement from it which is going to affect the meat levels energy. exactly you, you'll have less energy and i think one of the things as well like i'm not 100 percent sure but I'm assuming this would be a negative is you'd have quite disrupted sleep and recovery. Yeah, sleep sleep can be affected. Because you need your food to recover. So Reco- that would be. Recovery is going to be a bit, but again, you're only in a two-week state. So that's why I'm saying the effects of aggressive dieting for a two-week period are going to be fairly, fairly yeah. minimal. If you were to do it long-term, which by the way, you should not do. And that's one of the disadvantages of it that you can't do it long-term. What would you, what would be your time frame? For this aggressive would be like two weeks. Yeah. So just highlights people how short that period is mm-hmm. because I know there would be, I think it's very, to be fair, high five to us. Wow, fist pump five. That the fact we actually talk about these topics because a lot of personal trainers would shy away. And I've seen so many videos on social media who people who bash this topic. And I'm like, you, you bash it because you're actually uneducated on it. Yeah. This is categorically, and we said from the start, not for the general population. There's very specific <sighs> reasons why that, people do this. This is difficult because I'm going to contradict that a little bit here oh, as well. No. Is that someone who's really, really obese was to use the calorie calculator, put them on a high calorie intake, whereas they could go on an aggressive calorie intake from the calorie calculator and it'd be better suited for that population because they can diet down on the lesser food intake and it not be super low calories still. And also it may be more motivating for someone who's really, really overweight to lose a chunk of weight quite quickly, which kickstarts their weight loss journey. So no, that's that why- that doesn't I, contradict what I- I've No, 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 but I've, there's, 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 there's caveat to stuff and that's why there can never be an absolute answer to who this is oh, for yeah. and, and who this isn't for because it's complete, it can be dependent on behavior types, personalities of how they um, work with diets, better suited to those and what their previous experience is with dieting as well yeah well that's me for example i categorically could not because yeah, of yeah. my previous experience with such low calories and an eating disorder i would not do that and that is okay i'm very aware that i wouldn't be good in an aggressive diet mm-hmm. phase whereas some people might be okay with it or some people might want more information to reach out to someone and chat to them 
But yeah, I as an individual just, no, not for me. So one of the things I did with training was I completely took all my compounds out my training mm-hmm. and did a lot more exercise, which were l- less fatiguing and more stimulus. So like, a lot of cable stuff, a lot of exercise where I could maintain tissue without really straining myself where recovery was going to be difficult the next day, like barbell squats and deadlifts. Yeah. That's actually so true. Do you know one of the things that I've also not done in ages is squats? Yeah, I don't do them very often. I can't. What? <laughs> I don't know why you're looking at then. I um, barbell squats is one of the exercises that I've actually had to cut out. The only exercise I've had to cut out actually because of my running, because of my hips, I just can't comfortably lift mm-hmm. the weight anymore. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. Just quickly, um, you were talking about potentially m- like morbidly obese people having like more extreme calorie deficits. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you're aware of this. I'll put it on screen now. There's um, a story of a man who was uh, super morbidly obese. Um, I think he was uh, like 400 pounds uh, yeah. in Scotland. Uh, ended up going on a one-year fast. Uh, didn't eat any food for a year. Uh, supplemented with um, vitamins, coffee, tea, and juice. It was medically prescribed. Uh, Angus's what? doctors, I'll put it on the screen now, uh, wanted him to fast for a week. And he ended up going for 382 days, uh, lost 125 kilos in the end. Um, yeah, he, he had absolutely nothing. Not nothing. Uh, How heavy was he? He was 400 pounds, ended up going to the toilet once every 40 to 50 days. And it, there's like medical papers written on him. Yeah. I'd have to look at that. Yeah. It's crazy. Uh, Interesting. Uh, so here's the kind of before and after. Whoa. Yeah. Would not recommend that. No, 100% no. not. That yeah, is wild. What yeah. the hell? I didn't know you could survive off that. You ca- I, I thought no you energy. couldn't survive off like a week without food or Yeah, water. but he had like extreme amounts of fat stores available. So yeah, he was... That makes sense. Had all the vitamins, had waters, minerals. So all the stuff that you need to get from food, he yeah, was yeah, yeah. supplemented with. Except calories. You'd, there's a surely as well, though, when you're at that point, even doing something like having a, a Tom Hank is going to be strenuous to energy isn't it tom hank oh boy tones am i thinking the right thing playing the trombone playing the pink oboe um, we getting there any closer uh, that's a blow job <laughs> <laughs> okay. i know exactly what you're talking about Let's scale down I was, one uh, yeah using your hands then yeah, i know hands exactly up. what you're talking yeah, about yeah so i forgot it's, it's naming the podcast that we did was, which was amazing. Oh God, I feel like I've just tarnished the name. Now I'm going off the back. We'll talk about wanks. Um, <laughs> I said the word and I didn't say it. We did a podcast with Ethan Supley. Go and listen to it because he talked about his his weight loss and he was over four hundred pounds. Was he 500 pounds. I think he was five hundred, and he said in the podcast he had to be weighed on shipping scales. Mm. And that podcast was really. He's made an incredible transformation. So if you are interested in that one, we'll um, yeah. get Cal to pop it below and link directly to that podcast because it was really interesting. Got an email from British Podcast Awards. Did we win? <laughs> I, <never laughs> announced, yeah. I was literally just looking at that like 20 seconds ago. Yeah. Finally gets announced in 20 days. Yeah. So just on that note as well, guys, if you want to leave a review, you can absolutely do that. Yeah. I'd recommend you do do that because it really helps us. It really does help us, especially mm-hmm. with the podcast awards coming up. Whoop. The other thing I was quickly going to say is it can be slightly different, by the way, doing these aggressive dieting periods for women. Yeah, the reason the reason the main reason being is because I don't have a mental cycle. So the thing for me is I don't get into the late luteal phase and feel like shit. Feel like shit. <laughs> Hunger levels don't go up. I don't feel more tired training. And um, so I I would say also like if you're gonna do like or even attempt to try it or even read up on it, base it on also like your menstrual cycle. So don't start a two week aggressive diet just after you've ovulated and you're going into the the luteal phase, you're going to be a moody bitch. Yeah. Also, just a point to note is your menorrhea is obviously the absence of your menstruation yeah. and can happen for a variety of different reasons where you lose your period as a woman. And obviously, one of the reasons can be very, very low calories, but usually it's over an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. I never actually had that as a swimmer, whereas a lot of the swimmers did lose their periods. Yeah. And also things like fertility and hormone balance. There's a, yeah, we're all we're we're complex, yeah. aren't we? Also, me saying two weeks to the aggressive diet. By the way, is that's that's what I like doing. That's what I prefer doing. There's n- there's no there's no sort of set rule for this. 
but I like to err on the side of caution sometimes. There's a there's a coach that I follow on Instagram who's just done six weeks uh, aggressive dieting. Oh God! But then that's all he'll do. It depends on where his set points are. Like we look at that guy who's done a year, and um, I'm I was really quite lean, so doing two weeks for me is fine. And then moving out of it, the guy's done six weeks. He's dropped a lot of body fat. He was super motivated after the first two weeks. He dropped quite a lot. It's it's again, it's um, it's what suited to you as the individual, and that's why I'd never write aggressive dieting off, but also why I'd never recommend it as like a blanket cover statement to people because there's a lot of pros and cons of it. Yeah, hundred percent. I agree. I also think what a amazing podcast that was. How has a lot been taken out of it? And also, if, you, if you're watching the YouTube channel, by the way, and you're, you're thinking anything or you're wondering anything, if you've got any questions about anything, we do go over the, the comments on it. So feel free to drop any questions off the back of the, the podcast because we'll, we'll sometimes also go over them in like the next episode and stuff as well. I also think what is really great about our podcast, just bigging up our own podcast here because sometimes you just do that. The fact we, even in today's episode, people will be listening being like, oh my God, they disagree on so many things. Yeah. That is very important to even point out me and Ben don't agree on everything and it's so good that we can talk about topics because it would be so boring if we agreed on every mm. single thing we spoke about because we don't and we'd, we'd be lying to you. Um, even the topics like, what what there's quite a big topic today that where I was like, oh no, you like Weight Watchers, for example. Yeah. We have a quite differing views and that's really important, I think, from a, a podcast perspective where I wouldn't love listening to a podcast where everyone just agreed on everything. Oh, playing devil's advocate with stuff as well, though, because I think there's always, I don't think there's ever black and white with arguments, there's things that you can take from <laughs> from different perspectives. <laughs> what was that? Do you know what that reminds me of, by the way? I don't know if anyone's been watching it at the moment before we sign off. Stranger Things. Oh, it's wow. crazy. I nearly shit myself yesterday. I kept saying to Ben, so we watched the first episode. We Don't give, give people it away no, if you no. want to watch the episode. We won't give it away. I said to Ben, I thought this was more for children. Slightly more for right. children. It, uh, Slightly more for children, Carl. No. Well, I, okay, if you watched season three of Stranger Things, Carl, would you have said, oh, this could, I'd let my 10 year old child watch not this? Not 10, like 14. That's not a fucking child then, is it? No, I, I could not yeah. watch what I'm watching at it, 14. It's tough because a lot of the actors are like 14 years old, you know? That's so easy. So it does have a bit more kid vibes. It's definitely not something to But that's like, watch, that's like watching, okay, I'm going to watch Chucky because there's, there's kids in it. No, hey, but that's a rated 18 film. This is, I, if I watch this strange when I was 14, rated, by the way? I don't know. I think it's a 15. It does give off like kind of teen high school drama, rom-com, kind of like the OC or I believe, I believe also too. And when they started, they were literally 12. Yeah, literally. So you've wanted to grow up with them, like watching them. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness me, this, I'm terrified watching this season. I don't think I could watch it on my own. And I'm 25. I'm, all, I'm also scared of scary films, so it doesn't say You're scared lot. of your own shadow, so that's not I really am. take your perspective on it. <laughs> No, but it is really but watch it anyway yeah, it is. it's Fantastic. great but it's, uh, i think it's a bit more horrorish this this one yeah just to big up again i've now finished my ag1 athletic greens amazing amazing mm -hmm. amazing and as always thank you so much for listening please leave a review Pl please leave a review Continue it really us. helps us yeah keep tagging us and also if you've not done already because we know how many downloads we get a week now and you should be yeah. following. I was going to say following the Instagram page. Oh yeah, and subscribe. This do was it all, only, do it all. Yeah, do it all. This was only a recent thing that we did actually with the Instagram page. We were a little bit late to the party, but we're here now. And go and follow the Instagram page. It's the Not So Fit Couple podcast. Hope you enjoyed today's app, and we will catch you in the next one. Bye guys. Bye.